Welcome back to the Photo Banter Podcast. I'm your host, Alex Gagne, and on today's podcast, I speak with photographer Art Stryber. Art has worked with clients such as HBO, ESPN, Vanity Fair, and Wired Magazine, to name a few. In this interview, I speak to Art about how he's been approaching work during COVID-19, a recent photo shoot for Vanity Fair where he utilized a drone to keep social distance on the photo shoot, as well as some other steps Art and his team have been taking to prepare for productions moving forward during this pandemic. I also speak to Art about his approach to leadership, maintaining a business, as well as some of Art's personal projects. Art Schreiber is someone who has accomplished a lot during his photographic career, but has also continually given back to the photographic community by sharing his knowledge and experiences with others in this business. Art is someone who I have an immense amount of respect for, so I was happy to get him back on the podcast. So I hope you enjoy it, and thanks so much for listening. I now welcome back on returning guest Art Schreiber uh, to the podcast. Uh, crazy times we're living in right now, but I'm still happy to talk to you, Art. Um, I know a lot of photographers are kind of, everybody's just kind of confused of what's going on, how do I approach things. So I think that's why I was kind of excited to talk to you, not because I'm looking for any answers or anything like that, because no one has them. Um, but I think now more than ever, just staying in touch with this photo community and kind of sharing what, what are you hearing from your clients? What are you hearing from other people? How have you been handling whatever shoots you've been doing? Um, so that's kind of why I was kind of excited to have you back on. Um, but I guess kind of start off, I guess, how's the last three months been for you? Um, just with <laughs> everything, it's a loaded question, but w where's your mindset now? I know we're like three and a half months into this, but how are you doing, Art? Uh, well, uh, thank you for having me back. And I, I appreciate uh, your letting me off the hook in terms of uh, not having to uh, supp supply any no. Uh, prognostications or guesses. Yep. Um, but I, I will also say that, um, you know, even if you and I, you know, talked about, you know, what I'm hearing, uh, you know, that could change in a matter of, you know, days, weeks or months. Um, so I want to, I want to tread very, very lightly um, with, uh, with all of that. Um, but to answer your question, um, you know, like everybody else, I have uh, been riding the roller coaster and um, I have been trying to figure out um, what is best for my business, what is best for my career, um, uh, playing to my strengths, um, trying to read uh, as much as I can and stay in touch with as many clients as I can. Um, I've shot a couple of personal projects. I've shot a couple of editorial projects. Yeah. And, um, uh, you know, I, about two weeks into this thing, realized that I needed to uh, kind of reestablish a routine for myself. And so I am, you know, getting up every morning the way I used to. I'm walking the dog. I'm having my coffee and my yogurt and granola and berries. Yeah. And then I, you know, I, then I go to my office yeah. and um, I dive into, um, uh, you know, projects that, I've got right in front of me and I'm also setting aside time for long-term reorganizational uh, projects as well. Yeah. No, yeah, definitely. It's, uh, it's, I think that's the main thing. I think, cause like at the beginning of this, I was kind of the same way. I was just kind of lost and I kind of lost that routine because it's like at the beginning of it, it's like, am I supposed to still be marketing my work the same way I used to everything going on? It's just like a weird time. Like, how have you, like you mentioned, you've still been keeping in contact with your clients. Are you just kind of, in terms of like marketing and keeping your name out there, are you just kind of keeping in touch with the clients that you kind of regularly work with? Are you doing any outreach to like new clients or how you kind of been approaching that aspect of it? Well, I, I think we all, we have to recognize that, um, you know, every single industry uh, that we were associated with has been uh, put on hold and turned inside out. And, and when you say industry, um, you know, that's kind of vague and big picture. But what that really means is that the people in those industries um, have been rearranged and turned inside out. And we have to be incredibly sensitive to um, the, the personal lives of our clients that we know nothing about. Yeah. You know, are they at home with two small children? Um, did they 
move in with their aging parents to, you know, ensure that, you know, their aging parents didn't, you know, get, uh, didn't contract the virus. So uh, you just, the bottom line is you just have to tread very, very, very lightly because you just don't know. Mm -hmm. So what I've been doing is, um, you know, just reaching out via email and phone to the clients that I do, in fact, know, you know, really, really well. Yeah. Um, but but no new clients, yeah. you know. And um, I, I also appreciate, on the other hand, that my existing clients, um, everybody wants to go back to work. They want to work. And they want to know if we go back to work, when we go back to work, what is that going to look like? Mm-hmm. So I have been doing a lot of uh, research into, um, you know, the, the health uh, and safety requirements at the studios, on set, um, uh, with, uh, with clients, um, and with, with producers. Um, I've convened an every a bi-weekly, um, or no, semi-weekly um, Zoom call with all the producers I work with. Um, so that they are all on the same page. Wow. Um, uh, I've I had uh, each week, we've had um, each week, every two weeks, we've had a different guest. Okay. Um, and uh, the first guest was the director of safety at Paramount. The next two weeks later, it was the director of safety at Universal. Two weeks later, it was uh, an industry lawyer and uh, a, um, an industry payroll specialist and do you feel, and, and do you feel like do you feel like a lot of these clients because i feel like looking at your work a, a lot of the times like people go to you to solve problems it's always the we need to shoot 300 people in some weird location or we need to do 12 setups in tw- 20 minutes and a lot of the shoots it's like they're they're kind of leaning on you to solve these problems do you feel like the conversations you're having with your clients are they are they asking those questions to you like what do you, how are you going to approach it? Or is it more them kind yes. of dictating what they want to do to you? No, 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 yeah. absolutely. And we have to keep in mind that our clients are attempting to solve their own problems. Yeah. You know, like they've got to serve their creatives. They've got to serve uh, their bosses. They've got to serve their clients. Yeah. So they haven't really dug as deeply into um you know, what's it going to be like on set? Mm -hmm. Um, And so um, a couple of weeks ago, my digital tech and my studio manager and um, uh, a second digital tech um, got into uh, one of the photo studios in LA um, and we um, test drove a a Zoom shoot. And it, it wasn't a shoot. It was a you know, Zoom demo. Mm-hmm. And we did it for two different sets of clients and then we recorded it. So we could show people this is what a Zoom shoot looks like. So you basically and, have, have like a monitor on a stand or something that kind of rolls around and clients, you can kind of move it to where clients need to see or whatnot pretty much? Or? Uh, well, no, it's, um, it's a, uh, a, a camera, okay. you know, with a wide angle lens yeah. showing off the room and then figuring out how to zoom in the capture monitor Mm. so that on the zoom call, they were able to see the capture monitor. They were able to see, um, uh, you know, what it was like, um, to not be there. So we had the, we had the capture monitor zoomed in. Then we had a, uh, wide angle, you know, Canon showing off the room. And then we had an iPhone, on a gimbal, you know, that I was able to walk around that was also in the zoom and show, okay, now I'm walking into hair and makeup. Of course, there was nobody there. Now I'm walking into wardrobe, you know, so that we have this fixed camera and we had a mobile camera. But regardless um, uh, of that, the point is that the clients aren't thinking about that stuff and they are expecting us to think about that stuff. So it's incumbent upon us to, as we always had to be prepared when a client calls and says, hey, we need you to shoot, um, you know, 245 people. Um, You have to be able to say, oh, okay, 
here's how we're going to do it. Or let me do a little bit of homework. And that's how we're going to, you know, then after I've done my research, now I can tell you, this is how we're going to do it. You know, we've, we have always been in the problem solving business. We have always been in the creative problem solving business. And now we have a whole bunch of new creative, uh, well, logistical and creative problems to solve. And this from like, I guess like a business standpoint with that, do you envision that being like another line item you're going to charge your clients if they want that option? Or is it more just a thing you're going to offer to just kind of keep the, keep the, keep the business moving at this point? Oh, um, it's definitely, um, we're definitely going to charge for it. And, but you know, all we're going to charge for is, you know, the additional gear, Mm -hmm. you know? Um, but I, I will also say, uh, that, you know, once we started live streaming, essentially three or four cameras out of the studio, it occurred to me, oh my God, what if every stage um, every studio at this set of stages is doing the exact same thing, yeah. you know? And so I immediately got on the phone with the people who run all the stages. And I said, Hey, you guys, um, I just did this test drive and we live streamed, but you know, there were, we were only running four cameras. Mm-hmm. Some places are going to run six, Damn. you know? So you guys got to make sure that your internet is beefy enough to handle that new volume. And they were like, oh, my God, of course, you're right. So it's just a a number of, you know, uh, problems and then solving them begets other problems. And you don't know, uh, for example, all of the issues or problems until you dive into it. And and by that, I'll just I'll just give you a hint. Um, After figuring out, you know, the cameras and the gimbal and the Canon and the, the zoom, we realized that that was not the hardest thing to solve. Mm. The hardest thing to solve is going to be the sound. Oh, yeah. By leaps and bounds, the sound and client input is going to be the number one issue with remote viewing with clients not on set. Communication, that's the word. Oh, absolutely. Yeah. Yeah. No, that's, I mean, that's smart. You're just kind of testing it out. I've seen a couple other people. So yeah, it's just kind of rolling with those punches, but I think it's smart. You're doing that. And, uh, I know you've had a, you've had a look on your Instagram. You've had a couple in- interesting kind of editorial assignments within this time frame. Um, one, you got a lot of feedback for, I think it was for Vanity Fair, which you did a, a drone shoot, which was, uh, yes, sir. Portraits, I believe an actress, uh, I guess what Catherine was, O'Hara. What was yeah. kind of your experience with that? Was the drone thing something that the magazine requested, or was that something that you just wanted to utilize just for social distancing? And what was kind of your overall experience, kind of within that kind of workflow? I guess. Um, well, yes, the, the magazine insisted on shooting with the drone, um, and I pointed out that you know while the drone does uh, mitigate the risk of you know, spreading the virus, it, it then creates its own set of problems, um, which is that, you know, the file integrity is not as great as the Canon or the Hasselblad. And, um, you know, is the area where we want to fly the drone safe to fly the drone? And, uh, you know, what lens is fixed on the drone? And how close can the drone be to the talent? And um, how can the talent hear me? over the humming of the drone. So, you know, I, you know, I pushed back and, you know, Vanity Fair insisted and I said, okay, I'm going to figure out how to make this work. And, uh, you know, that was like three or four weeks into this thing. And immediately, you know, people responded and said, oh my God, you know, you know, is the drone the future and the answer? And I said, no, 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 no. It's just another tool Mm -hmm. in the toolkit. It's just another tool. And the truth is there are two shots in that portfolio that I could not have gotten without the drone. Mm -hmm. She's up on a ladder. Literally she's up maybe 16 feet and uh, I couldn't have gotten that shot without a drone. And then the shot of her from above uh, where she's poolside. 
I couldn't have gotten that from the drone. Yeah, it's cool. It's like um, these weird circumstances have forced you to get like creative in ways you, you probably never thought you were going to utilize something like this. So it's like, who knows down the line, even when COVID's over, now you're like, oh, now I have that experience. Like That's another uh, tool in my bag, a bag of tricks, you know? Yes, that's exactly right. And, uh, you know, a lot of people, I think we talked about this briefly when we were setting this up uh, with the amount of stress, everything going on, you know, a lot of people feel pressure to like create work and do you kind of feel that pressure even when assignments aren't coming in because like i think a lot of people get bogged down looking at instagram and it turns into this like competition thing which it's not all bad but did you kind of did you still feel creative during these times and did you feel uh like a need to put work out there you know what i mean um you know those are those are all really good questions and um I think there was a lot of pressure on all of us at the very beginning of this thing. You know, just be creative. You know, just um, this is an opportunity for you to, you know, think outside the box and, you know, photograph the decaying fruit uh, uh, in your refrigerator. And I don't necessarily agree with the idea that creativity is this kind of on-demand thing that you or I can turn on and off at will. You're either, you know inspired or you're not inspired you're moved or you're not moved um you're compelled or you're not compelled and just because you've got free time on your hands doesn't mean that you are compelled to be creative and this isn't just free time this is this is just monumental anxiety provoking free time so it's not just like you know uh, a sabbatical where you are you know hiking through um you know, Monument Valley or the Himalayas. This is, oh, uh, the entire world is frozen. You could contract a virus. Um, You've got kids, you've got sick parents, you've got, you know, um, rent to pay. And and so go be creative. So I think that was a misdirection at the very beginning. Um, But yes, I did feel compelled to, to shoot. And when I was inspired by something, I shot it. Um, and I, I, uh, I did a couple of, um, uh, I, I worked on a, a long-term project that I'd been working on for a long time, um, which is just, you know, iPhone photos shot late at night on my street. Um, I was really um, compelled to go to the mecca of retail in the city, Rodeo Drive, yeah. um, at the very beginning, because not only had they closed the doors and put up signs, but they had 98% of the stores had emptied the shelves of merchandise. So these were, this was a ghost town. And then, you know, it was vandalized and I have not been back. And that is, I am now putting that on my list of things to do, you know, to go back and look at what Rodeo Drive looks like after it was boarded up, um, you know, because of the vandalism. So, so yes, I have done some shooting. I've done some personal projects, um, but I don't want to, you know, guilt anybody into thinking that, you know, they, there's some kind of uh, creative expectation, no. you know, during this time. Yeah, I think, yeah, it, yeah like you said, if you feel compelled to shoot, if not, I think there's a lot of value in taking a step back and this, like, you know, this, even just think, without even shooting, just thinking about what you want to do or what you've been doing or looking at your old stuff. Like I know you say you've been looking at your archive and organizing that. So it's just utilizing your time a million different ways. And, you know, looking at your Instagram, I think uh, some of the most powerful photos, I think, uh, were just the photos you were just visiting your father, who I believe is like in a senior living uh, home. And uh, one of them, I believe, was published in the New York Magazine because uh, I think I can relate to it. My grandmother's in a similar situation. She can't live her building. Mm-hmm. She she normally likes going to Panera Bread. That's where she likes going. Now she can't. So it's like all this frustration. And it's kind mm-hmm. of looking at those photos. They were just very, it looks like you just shot them on your phone. And it's just, I think when you look back in 10, 20 years, those photos are very powerful because it's like a lot of people can just relate to the, that's the real element of this virus is like you're, you're separated from people. You can't meet with your loved ones and whatnot. Um, what was kind of, how did they kind of come about to publish the photos in New York magazine of your father and what was kind of his response? Cause I know you posted it on Instagram. There's kind of some really cool photos on there. 
Um, well, I will say he was amused. And I, I did not, by any stretch of the imagination, set out to get these images published. I, I, I literally went out there, um, you know, like I, I used to go out there every week. Uh, now I go out probably every two weeks. Yep. And um, I just took a picture and I was going to send it to the other members of my family. And I thought, you know what? I'm just going to post this on Instagram because this is what I'm shooting right now. Mm -hmm. So I posted it on Instagram and the very first one got an incredible response. And, um, and, you know, a number of people said, you know, oh my God, I can relate. And this is so moving. So, you know, the next time I went out, I took pictures and posted it again. Mm -hmm. And the, and then out of the blue, um, my syndication agent let me know that German GQ was interested in publishing one of the photos. Oh, wow. And so it ran uh, on their website, yeah. on German GQ. Mm -hmm. And then weeks later, uh, New York Magazine reached out and said, hey, we've seen these pictures on, pictures on Instagram and uh, we want to you know, put them in um, an issue we're doing on seniors. And I said, well, you know, they're just, you know, just an iPhone photo, um, which goes to show you that that idea of something being just an iPhone photo um, is, you know, no longer valid uh, in, in terms of um, diminishing its, you know, quality or um, ability to stand alone in a, in a magazine. Um, so... New York Magazine ran the picture and they were very, very nice to send me copies. And I got a couple of copies and took, went over to my dad and he was, you know, he was amused. Um, and uh, um, I think a little appreciative and shared it with the nurse that's in the back of that photo. And, um, you know, I was just out there again this weekend with, uh, with the family. Um, no, I thought, I thought, you know, it's, you I thought it was great because it was very like human, like you said, like people can relate to it. Because like you know, a lot of your work is very like, like it's, it's lit, it's stylized, and this is this like it just shows art, this art you as a person, like your life. You know what I mean? It wasn't some Hollywood actor. It's just like, oh, I can I can really relate to that. I can see my grandfather, or my grandmother in that picture. So I think that's just kind of shows you, like you said, like it doesn't matter what camera yeah. you have, like if you can convey a message, message, and it can be powerful, and people can relate to it. That that'll go farther than anything you know yes i think you're absolutely right mm -hmm. and uh another thing uh talking to some of your old interns uh i know yuri uh one of your old interns from los angeles amazing photographer yes. i was talking to her and she was telling me about this newsletter you've been doing with with i think this people you work with some of your old employees interns people in the industry that you're friends with uh you've been doing this thing called the the photo dork sipsa newsletter yes um yes what, what kind of compelled you to do that and uh because I, th I thought it was great like i said n now more than any time even people don't have the answers just like talking to people in this industry it's just i think it makes people feel at ease as much as they can be during this you know what i mean yeah you know it's so funny because i just wrote myself a note as you were asking me the question uh reminding me that I need to publish this week's issue, which was due last night, but I got tied up doing a bunch of other stuff. But um, literally the first week of quarantine, um, it hit me that, you know, this group of people that I work with that um, know each other, that were my interns or are my assistants or are now photographers who are using the old assistants or using the interns or former interns that are now photographers, you know, we, we have this annual Christmas party that um that i've been doing for about 21 years and um you know so <clears throat> i've obviously got everybody's email address and i just thought these people are connected to each other but they only while some of them are you know actual good friends a lot of them adore each other and appreciate each other but they only see each other on set yep. and that's how they that's how they keep up with each other and that's gone um, and not only is that gone, but there's a ton of information out there that um, not everybody might be able to find or accent uh, or access, or it, it might not even occur to them to look. So this was in the early days of, you know, the unemployment um, benefits from the federal government and the PPP loans 
uh, from the SBA and the uh, EIDL loans from the SBA. So um, I, you know, started saying, hey, you know, here's what a couple of people are doing and here's some links. Um, and then I just got more creative and, you know, I would see, you know, people would text me a photo of them, you know, uh, you know, building a new deck. And I'd say, hey, look, this guy's building a new deck. Or, um, you know, this woman uh, just got her hair cut. Or, you know, this guy is baking sourdough, you know. Um, or, you know, this woman is chopping down trees. And so these are all, you know, people that everybody knows. Yeah. And it was inspiring. Mm -hmm. You know, it was inspiring to see that, you know, somebody was growing a vegetable garden or somebody had, um, you know, taken the time to, you know, redo, repaint their house or, you know, one friend of ours built himself a pond in, uh, in his backyard in London, um, you know, from without a backhoe, you know, um, uh, but th the point was to keep the community together, um, and, and then share articles that some people might not have seen and, about and, and some, and survival some, and some funny memes, some good memes <laughs> and, and some good memes. Yeah. It was like, I want to keep this thing lighthearted, uh, and I want it to be informative. Yeah. Um, but I will tell you, it is a lot of work. No, definitely. I, yeah. I really respect it. Cause like I was saying before, like it's just like this staying in communication with people is talking to my friends that I work with and other photographers that this, even if it's like bad news or, or anything, it's just people want to hear it instead of this being lost out in the sea. And it's good to feel a part of that team. And I think from talk, I've interviewed a few people that have interned for you um, over the course of years of doing this. And, you know, everyone, when they, when I talk to them, they say being your intern was just such a valuable experience. And the thing that I was kind of interested about is being that you're a leader, a lot of these sets, you're working with a lot of people, um, what's kind of your approach to this kind of being a leader of these teams and is it something you're like constantly evaluating on how you can improve like what's kind of your approach to to like building these teams and working with all these people you think ah uh, wow um that's a big question yeah i would say that first and foremost um my my approach is to uh be supportive and to listen and be gracious and be uh, inclusive of, you know, everybody's input. Mm -hmm. And um, I was just listening to a, there's a great podcast, um, uh, which whose name I'm going to forget, but I'm going to look for it now. And it's all about, it's all about work. Yep. Um, and it, it's about the, the psychology of work. And um, uh, it's, it's by a guy named Adam Grant. Um, and it's called work life. Yeah. And, uh, I, the episode I was just listening to was talking about, uh, he, he anecdotally mentioned, um, airline pilots who, when they get the crew together, um, before a flight, the more successful flights. And by that, I mean, um, less conflict and, um, uh, and, uh, faster, um, loading and unloading of the plane and, and um, on-time departures and arrivals uh, comes from pilots who, when they talk to their crew, use the first-person plural. Yeah. They say we. Um, and I, I've always believed that this was a team um, sport, that collaboration was key, that you know, hearing every single opinion was important. But then at the end of the day, it's on me. Yeah. So... I, I have to be benevolent, um, but I also have to, um, I have to make the final decision. And uh, the, the only analogy I've ever been able to come up with, which is not a good one, is the quarterback of a football team, yeah. which is to say that, you know, I have to inspire everybody on the offense because if the um, front line doesn't block, yeah. if the wide receivers don't run their routes, if the, you know, running back, uh, you know, isn't able to, you know, take off with the ball and find a hole, um, then I can't move the ball down the field. Yeah, and so 
as lame as that analogy is, uh, it's really the only thing, you know, I've been able to, to come up with. And, um, you know, I, this was a, this was not something that was innate or, um, that I knew from the very beginning. I, I had to learn this, mm-hmm. you know, I had to learn these essentially managerial skills. Um, I had to learn that, uh, you know, the crew doesn't know exactly what you want them to do unless you explain it to them, obviously. Um, so at the beginning of every single shoot, I gather the, uh, the crew together and I say, this is what we are doing today. And this is why we are photographing this person. And I give them as much context as I can so that they are as much on the same page as I am. And then I say, okay, so for this setup, I want to put up this light and this light and this light. And I am prepared for somebody to say, hey, you know what? You should probably use a strip, you know, with a grid as opposed to a beauty dish with a grid. And here's why. Mm. And I have to, on the spot, I have to be able to go, oh, my God, that's a great idea. Let's do that. Or, you know what? We thought of that. And, and here's why I want to stick with the beauty dish because I think it's going to be more effective to do this. Yeah. So. I want to create this sense of everybody being on the same page, everybody headed in the same direction um, so that the day is a success. Yeah. And, you know, I think a lot of maybe younger photographers listening, I know on your website, you offer like an internship. People can apply. I think the applications just have to be in by January 31st every year. Um, mm-hmm. When you're looking to bring someone on your team, either intern, new assistant, new digitech, what is it you think you're looking for when you're going to hire someone and bring someone new on the team? Is it 100% their technical ability? Is it this their attitude? Is it this, what is it you're looking for? Because I'm sure a lot of people reach out to you and a lot of younger photographers, they're kind of getting their, want to get their foot in the door assisting or whatever. Like what advice would you kind of give to them when they're just first starting out, just trying to get into assisting or whatever it may be kind of working in this business, you think? Well, I, I have to say that the, the, our internships for this year uh, were canceled yeah. um, because, you know, A, there's nothing to do. Yeah. Uh, there's a pandemic. And, you know, when we go back to work, mm-hmm. our crew size is going to be limited like crazy, not only by the budget, but also by the size of the room and the scale of the project. So I don't want to, um, you know, get anybody's hopes up. No. Um, but, you know, someday we will have interns again. And to answer your question, um, years ago, we had an intern uh, and we said, OK, you know, we, we hired him as the intern. We went out on a job and, you know, we went into the stage and I said, OK, um, would you please go get me a head and a pack? Mm-hmm. And he said to me, what's a head and a pack? And I went, oh, OK, wow, that's my fault. You know, I, I can't bring an intern on Mm -hmm. who doesn't know the basics of what we do, because this is educational, but it's not rudimentary educational. This is, you know, a building block, you know, on your path to, you know, a greater understanding of, uh, you know, assignment photography for editorial entertainment and commercial clients. So, so then I came back to the office and do what I always did, which is I sat down with my staff and I said, okay, how do we improve this going forward? And we came up with a questionnaire and the questionnaire, you know, is multifaceted. It's not, you know, not only do you know, uh, you know, what camera systems do you know, but you know, what kind of grip and strobe knowledge do you have? And we've been very, very honest with people and said, if you, don't have this kind of grip or strobe knowledge, we highly recommend that you get an internship or a job in the grip room yep. at one of LA's photo studios one. and then come back to us. Yep. And a number of people have, and that's been hugely rewarding and beneficial because it's not fair to my photo assistants who are doing a lot of the guiding um, of the interns that they don't know the basic um you know, uh, pieces of equipment that we're using. Mm -hmm. So, so that's, that's number one. Number two is, 
um, there is a personality component that is really, really hard to measure when somebody is sitting uh, you know, opposite you in an interview. Yeah. And uh, a couple of years ago, my longtime um, executive producer and I, Elaine Brown, looked at each other and you know, we said, you know what, there's this intangible quality that you really won't be able to ascertain until they're actually on the job. And that is, does the person just get it? You know, do they just get it? Because we've had interns that have been on set moving like a hummingbird on Red Bull. (laughs) And, you know, thinking that the entire weight of the shoot rests on their shoulders. And we've had interns who um, have literally frozen and not moved until they were told exactly what to do. So where is that, do they get it quotient? Where is that balance of understanding, um, hey, um, if somebody asks for a pack and a head, I should probably ask them, hey, do you need an AC cord or a C stand or a sandbag or a modifier? Mm -hmm. You know, where is that person who knows when to dip his or her toe into, you know, the bigger conversation and knows when to just stop and listen. 100%. Um, yeah, it's like a, so we go ahead. I was just going to say, it's like a real skill. Like I assisted for years and it took me a long time because it's like when I first starting out, I was like, you're happy to, you're so happy to be there, but you like don't want to step on anyone's toes. But you, over time, I think you realize you, you, you want to think a step, two steps ahead of whatever photographer you're working for and be like, Hey, what's this guy maybe going to need? And this, you kind of, I feel like you build that confidence over time and working with people and building those relationships and being like, all right, I can push this guy and say something. And it's just like, cause I remember when I started out, it was like, I had those nerves too. It's like, I don't want to say anything. So I don't want to piss this dude off and I don't want, you know what I mean? So it's just like building that confidence over time. At least that was kind of my experience with it. That's exactly right. And the conversation I just had with you, we now have with them. And we say there's this intangible quality that we can't name that we are looking for. Mm -hmm. And, um, and, 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 and also we are never going to ask you to do something that we wouldn't do ourselves or have done in the past. Mm -hmm. We are never going to ask you to do something, you know, uh, you know, medial or trivial that one of us wouldn't do. Um, But we've got um, our hands full and we might need you to, you know, empty the trash cans or go get the coffee, but we will also get you coffee. That's right. You know, you know, we will also empty the trash cans ourselves. So everyone, um, everyone start. Everyone starts at the bottom. It's brick by brick, like you said. I think it's good advice. That, you, that's exactly you, right. You go work at you go work at the rental house, and then you work your way up, and then you can assist, and then you then you start shooting on your own. It's just brick by brick, and uh, you know, one thing I'm always kind of interested in about, like talking to people like you, who who obviously accomplish a lot, and people really respect your work. Um, when you were kind of first getting in this business, like, what motivated you? Like, were, were there goals from the get go? Like, are you like a competitive person? And yeah, what, what was kind of the driving force to you? Like, did you always just kind of believe that you were going to be successful or, or did you have times where you doubted yourself? I know it's a loaded question, but it's a lot in there, but. I, I don't know that it's a loaded question, but it sounds like there were probably four questions. Yeah, I know. Um, so let me see if I can break them down. Um, so my motivation uh, was and, uh, is, um, just, uh, you know, I just love the work and I love meeting people. I I love the new assignment. I love trying to, you know, capture somebody's essence. Mm -hmm. Um, I love the, um, you know, the production, uh, whether it's big or small of putting a shoot together and seeing it from start to finish. Um, I, I love the idea of being able to tell, help tell somebody's story and, you know, my goals have changed over the years and, um, I never, you know, said, I want to be a success. I would say like, wow, I would love to be in time magazine, uh, or I would 
love to have uh, a cover of uh, Vanity Fair or, you know, wow, I'd love to be able to do that someday. And, and, and here's, I think, what's more important than those kinds of um, uh, focus goals is this idea that two ideas. You're in it for the long haul. Number one. And, and number two, I really believe that you have to have this incredible combination of persistence and patience. Yeah. And, and those are completely uh, contradictory ideas yeah. because you've got to be, you know, just tirelessly uh, hungry for the work and interested and excited about the work and then really, really patient about how long it might take to get you to your goals, mm. but you can't let up. Yeah, definitely. It's yeah, like you say, it's patience and like, and I think the thing a lot of people struggle with is like, like truly like believing in yourself. Like, did you kind of always yes. have that confidence in yourself or did you even like starting out? Or like, Oh, absolutely you know, not. Parts oh. of your career, like, Oh man, like, am I still going to be in this business? Cause I think, that's like, exactly right. The photographer that I, yes. I've met, dude, that's what I'm most impressed about. Like anybody can really, you can learn technical stuff over time to a certain point, but like being able to like truly believe in yourself is like the hardest thing, I think. Yes, it's about, yes, self-confidence and, uh, and faith. Um, and that is tested, it's tested every day. You know, it's tested on every shoot. Um, it's tested in every client meeting. It's tested in every pitch and every treatment. And I don't have a bottomless well yeah. of self-confidence. Uh, my self-confidence has to be recharged. Yeah. Um, uh, you know, um, not as, you know, frequently as, you know, your, I would say, classic narcissist. <laughs> um, and I will not name any names, but my, my, my point is that, um, you know, I would say all artists are insecure and, you know, my, you know, one of my, uh, private theories about human beings is that we're all operating from, uh, a sense of insecurity and, you know, wanting to be, uh, accepted and all of us just manifest that differently, mm. you know? Um, so I have to, um, dip into my self-confidence. I have to recharge my self-confidence. I've definitely had setbacks. I've had slow times. I've had, um, you know, uh, work that was not great. I've had, you know, work that was not appreciated, um, work that was unsuccessful. Uh, absolutely. Yes. It, it, it is not, it, you know, it is, you don't magically get to this place and it's smooth sailing. Mm -hmm. that, that just is a myth. You know, it is, um, to quote one of the greatest motion pictures of all time, Jerry Maguire, um, it is an up at dawn, pride swallowing siege. Yep. No, definitely. Absolutely. Absolutely. You know, when you first start this business, you're just working by yourself primarily. Like you, people can go look back at the first interview you do with Art and you can hear more about his beginning of his career. Um, but when you start growing, and growing and you got assistance and now looking at your website like you got a studio manager an executive producer a i think a business manager then you have your rep um are, are certain points in those career was it like was it like you're basically kind of investing in yourself like bringing more people on the team and like were those times in your career when you're bringing more people on was it a stressful thing did you kind of view it as a hey i need to make this investment in myself to keep this train moving forward and up or how do you kind of view this, the business aspect of kind of bringing more and more people on, I guess. Well, you know, um, it, it, it is a slow, it is a slow build. Mm -hmm. There's no question. It is a, it is a slow build and, um, uh, you know, it's, and it's a leap of faith. It is a leap of faith to move your office, uh, out of your bedroom. Mm -hmm. And then it's a leap of faith to rent a separate office space. Yep. And it's a leap of faith to all of a sudden go, okay, I'm going to hire a studio manager. Yep. Um, you know, it is a 
leap of faith. And, um, and not only is it a leap of faith, but then you have to be very, 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 very pragmatic about your overhead and uh, watching the bottom line like a crazy person, which I will admit um, I came to very late in the game hmm. because, you know, like everybody else, you know, up until, you know, March 12th, you know, we just thought the world was going to continue to spin the way the world was going to continue to spin. Yeah. Um, and then the world stopped spinning. So um, those, you know, leaps of faith um, have to come with a very, very, very pragmatic plan for how you are going to, you know, continue to make them work. Mm. And, um, you know, the, the, very, the very first... Um, time I, you know, hired a studio manager, it was, you know, it was a, a first assistant uh, type person. And I said, you know, I really, I think I need you in the office, you know, full time. And she said, wow, okay, um, I, I get it. And so then I had somebody in the office full time. Yeah. And this was, this was years ago. Then, um, you know, I didn't have a regular first assistant, I was using, you know, one or two people all the time, you know, honestly, just for consistency. Mm -hmm. um, then, you know, we, you know, I, I hired a new studio manager. And um, I realized, wow, you know, the, the one thing that is really suffering here is my archive. Yeah. I need, you know, an archive manager. So I hired an archive manager. Um, to keep up with the demands of the archive. And then I said, you know, oh my God, I want the same person on every single job. And I hired a first assistant. Hmm. So, you know, this thing, it just kept growing and growing and growing. And um, it's a lot of overhead, yep. you know, and that is a real uh, issue and a real consideration, especially right now. Yep. Um, and, you know, I have, looked at it and looked at it and looked at it. And I just can't wrap my head around right now the way I work, you know, doing it any other way. Yep. But that is constantly up for review as the nature of the work has changed. Mm -hmm. And not just, not just the lack of work due to the, uh, the pandemic, but um, the kinds of assignments that I'm doing. Um, and what each of these people does has changed. You know, I, I don't know if you've ever seen my um, my little diagram called the four aspects of yeah, yeah, freelance I, photography. I saw, I saw it. I'll, I'll post it. I'll put it on the uh, – when I edit this podcast, I'll put it up there. People can see it. I screenshotted it when you did it on that uh, seminar last a couple weeks ago. Oh, okay, great. So the, the four aspects are productions, your shoots, your archive and what it's doing for you, mm -hmm. um, your marketing – and your money, you know, the financial aspect of your business. And, and over the years, um, my executive producer has gotten a little bit more into the marketing and my studio manager who was just dealing with the archive and um, the marketing got into production a little bit. And my business manager is, you know, weighing in a little bit with marketing and production and you know, like everybody else in every other creative industry, we all started to recognize that we couldn't just be, uh, you know, silos, yep. you know, that you had to be able to kind of uh, weigh in and adapt and morph when needed into these other areas, mm -hmm. which is not to say that those areas are gone. Those four aspects are still paramount. You know, they are they are inviolable in in they are invaluable i'm not well they're invaluable but i was going to say um uh, um sorry uh, i think the word is inviolable you know they are um you know they're they're unchangeable yeah. they're they're locked and um and those aspects are those have to be attended to mm -hmm. um in some way shape or form either by you or by your studio manager or your, um, you know, your partner or your significant other or your 
brother or your best friend or, you know, whoever it is, um, you know, back to or you yeah. to continue to build, you know, your career. And no I, question. Yeah, definitely. And, you know, another thing I was kind of interested in talking to you about, like I know right now, I believe your rep is Giant Artists. You've been on, you were on Stockland Martell before, and I think maybe a couple others. Um, why partner with a rep? Like what value do they bring? Um, and cause I know talking to some photographers, some people are going the route of like, they have a rep that just works exclusive exclusively with them now. And instead of mm -hmm. being on a team of photographers, like what's your kind of approach to that element of the business, uh, being that you've been with a couple of different agents and like, what do you think it kind of brings to your business? I guess. Well, um, in the name of total transparency, uh, and this is not, you know, a week old, but I am no longer with Giant Artist. Oh, wow, man. That's and cutting news. I, I'm, I'm out of the loop, man. Sorry. <laughs> no, that's OK. It's, you know, I'm not making a, you know, a big public announcement, but yeah, because yeah. we're going to have this discussion, yeah. I think it's, you know, it's fair to, you know, to your listeners yeah. um, to, you know, share my Definitely. thinking, mm -hmm. um, which was that, you know, when work comes back, um, I really can't afford to give up a percentage of my fees. Yep. And as you just heard me list, I've got uh, an executive producer who will act like my agent. I've got a studio manager. I've got a business manager. Yep. And I've got this incredible infrastructure in-house. Yep. And this is really a remarkable team yep. with um, you know years of knowledge in the business. And I am going to rely on them very, very, very heavily, which is not to say that um, uh, Giant is not a great agency, which is not to say that um, agency, the agency model mm -hmm. um, is a bad model. But I will say that, you know, in the new world order, um, who knows if the traditional agency model can survive? I, you I know, view, I that view, is I view it like. I think if I think there's some value to it. If you're like a younger photographer, I think there's probably value in like joining a team of like other established artists. But like looking at you, you've been in this business and you've you put in the hard work and the hours to establish your name in this industry. So it's like when you go to an agent, I, I would assume like you're not looking for them so much to like get your name out there because people know who you are. So it's like I guess it's kind of it's different during whatever points in your career you're at probably. I think I think that's fair, um, but I but I also you know you know I would be careful about the the notion of the the younger photographer. Yeah, um, true. Because um, I don't I don't think that that is the measure mm -hmm. of um, you know I really don't think that's the measure of whether or not you should you know be thinking about getting a rep and and honestly. When I, uh, when I lecture, I, the point I make is that um, uh, getting a rep is like getting married. Yeah. And um, it, it's absolutely like getting married. Yeah. And th the idea, the traditional idea of marriage is that, you know what, I am growing as a human being uh, you are growing as a human being and together we are going to grow together. Mm -hmm. You know, that's, that's kind of the premise, you know, um, that we are going to, uh, support each other, nurture each other, um, be there for each other, uh, push each other and share mm -hmm. that, that to me is what an agent is, is all about. And, um, if you grow apart, then you get divorced. Yeah. If, you know, you get married for the wrong reason and the relationship becomes untenable, you get a divorce. Mm -hmm. So, the, the, so then the question becomes, am I ready to get married? You know, yeah. am I, am I ready to get married? And I was just having this conversation literally yesterday with this very talented emerging photographer. Um, and I, and I said, look, the, the days of agents, um, uh, taking an, a relatively, you know, unknown, untested photographer and developing them mm -hmm. are kind of gone. Yep. You know, the idea that a, um, and this is going to sound really creepy, that a, uh, you know, 
40 year old marries a 20 year old. (laughs) That's just awful. (laughs) You know, um, let's scrap that analogy. Um, you know, those, those days are gone. Thank God. But so that analogy doesn't work. That metaphor doesn't work. So, but the point is that you're going to be a lot more desirable to an agent if you have spent three, four, five years on your own, Mm -hmm. developing your business, um, learning to deal with clients, um, uh, establishing uh, solid business practices. Um, Then, then, yes, start talking to agents. Um, And by the way, talk to the agent and two months later, talk to the agent again and talk to the other people that are represented by that agent, talk to clients, Hmm. do not go to Las Vegas and get married, you know, go out on a number of dates and, you know, and, and then, you know, um, go on vacation with them and go camping Mm -hmm. and, uh, (laughs) you know, see, you know, all of those tests to see if you are compatible. Um, you know, that is, um, uh, you know, that is what I think is going to lead you to, uh, success Cause like, is really being on the same page with your agent. Yeah, definitely. And like, cause in terms of like when you're doing like shooting advertising and some of these bigger productions, do you feel like you need that middleman? Like, like companies, they don't want to deal with you directly pretty much or what's kind of been your vibe in terms of that? Like if you, well, were... yes. The, the, you know, at its, um, at one of the core opportunities of, of partnering with an agent is that the agent is the bad cop, Mm -hmm. you know, that the agent is, you know, negotiating on your behalf and you are the artist and you don't get mired in the muck of, you know, the business. Um, so that is a huge benefit for you. Mm. Um, but there are drawbacks. We have heard all kinds of awful stories about um, business managers um, in other businesses who are, you know, ripping off their right. musical uh, talent I, or, I've you heard, know, I, even in our business. I've heard a lot. I've interviewed a lot of them. A lot of them end up in court in divorces, Art. <laughs> like a lot of, there you go. <laughs> I've heard so, these war stories. <laughs> so, uh, so I am calling for transparency you know, I'm calling for, um, you know, uh, just, you know, all of the things that are the hallmarks of a good marriage, which are communication, transparency, Mm -hmm. uh, trust, you know, and mutual appreciation. Mm -hmm. No, that's all good advice. Um, You know, enough business talk. Let's let's talk some fun photography art. Let's have some fun here. Uh, you did, ah. you did, you did a, you did a really cool shoot. I, I don't know when it was recently. It was on your Instagram. I'm not sure when you shot it. You shot 233, you shot weird Al Yankovic and then 233 lookalikes. Uh, I was curious, what was that for? And like, what kind of went into that production? Because it, it, it looked like a handful. Uh, it was a handful. Those were, uh, big fans of his and he has this just amazing, uh, fan base, this incredibly loyal fan base mm-hmm. that has been with him for years. Yeah. And um, the the folks at the New York Times uh, Sunday Magazine um, wanted to uh, celebrate um, his, you know, um, kind of resilience and enduring popularity mm-hmm. uh, by um, by photographing him uh, with his fans. And, um, so what we had to, you know, wrap our heads around was, you know, how were we going to take this idea from Amy Kellner at the New York times Sunday magazine? Mm -hmm. And, you know, how were we going to reach out to his fans and not end up with an avalanche of people? This was back in January before, um, the pandemic. So we had, you know, that was kind of the big problem. Number one was how to reach his fans, how to limit the number of people, you know, how to screen, uh, these people, how to get them there, um, how to, uh, check them in, how to manage, you know, that they didn't bring their cell phones in. Um, and 
Um, and then my issue was, okay, how many people can I fit onto stage one at Quixote Studios? And, and then how am I going to light them? Um, and, uh, you know, what, what lens am I going to use? And, you know, what f-stop and how much power is it going to take to, to light this whole thing? So this was just the classic um, example of, you know, massive uh, amounts of different problems to solve. Yeah. And um, with a, I will be honest, a limited editorial budget. Yeah. You know, this wasn't, you know, all the gear you can eat. Mm -hmm. um, this was, you know, you've got, a, a, this is your budget for gear. Um, and, and no pre-light. You know, oh, there's no pre-light. No, no. So, I exactly. So now we've got to light this entire stage, um, essentially in the morning, without having tested the theory for the light, and we've got to light it quickly because we really do need to start shooting by you know two or three in the afternoon. Yep. Um. So, um. You know, I, you know, here's what I would have loved to have done was I would have loved to have hung all of the lights from the lighting grid, uh, yeah. but we, we didn't have time, yep. you know, so we only really had time to, uh, light from the ceiling down the middle of what turns out to be like a wedge of pie. Yeah. Like it, the, the, the design is that weird Al is at the the front of this, you know, uh, charging um, uh, horde of, and they're not charging, but you know, it's it's a wedge, you know, it's a V, it's yep. a V wedge. Mm -hmm. So I knew that okay, I can't light this whole thing from the top. I have to light from the sides. I have to cross light it, and. I know that the light is going to fall off by the time we get to the middle. So I'm going to light the middle from, um, uh, I'm going to light the middle from the top Got it. because I can't get to the middle any other way. Um, and let's just cross our fingers and see if that works. And was the final shot, and, was it all done in one shot or was there like some composite? In yeah, there? no, uh, At, well, no, the New York times doesn't oh, yeah, allow true, you to true. composite, True, it didn't you know, that. so that, that is all in camera. And, and, and I will say that, the, the, here's the math I didn't do. And there's always math I didn't do. There's always something I didn't think of. Yeah. Um, <laughs> and what I didn't think of in this case was that if you're shooting a group of people or you're shooting anything that's that deep, then what you really need to have happen is that the group has to rise in the back. Mm. You know, in order for the horizon to be shortened. Yeah. And we could not afford the risers. Got it. And I was really frustrated because I was, you know, going up and down on the scissor lift, trying to make Al be, you know, the focal point and not distort the frame yeah. and fill the back of the room, mm. you know, and that was that was really hard and um, really, uh, really frustrating. Um, and then I went, oh, I get it. Um, these people should be on risers and they're not. Yeah, so that's, that's where that's where like the where the, the creative mind's like, shit, I'll just pay for it. But then you're like, oh, no, the business mind comes in like, hell no, we got to make money on this job. You know, it's like that constant like battle sometimes. Well, yes and no. Yeah. Like, I think you've, you've, you've brought up a really interesting dialectic, yeah. but I wouldn't put it in those terms Got it. because, you know, I'm not in, you know, I'm not shooting editorial to make money. Got it. Um, you know, yes, it, it, there is some money to be made and cost to be covered, mm -hmm. but the dialectic is really, and, and you named it, um, w which is, it, it's a dialectic of, uh, these two parallel tracks, yeah. the aesthetics of the shoot and the logistics of the shoot. Yep. You know, it, it, it's not about, it, and money is just one of the logistics. Mm -hmm. So on every single shoot, if you draw two parallel lines, one is aesthetics, one is logistics, and then you try to find the places where 
those lines cross. Yeah. And that's where, you know, the great shot, you know, might happen. Mm. Um, you know, which is not to say that great shots can't happen if the logistics are not in your favor, um, because they absolutely can. Um, uh, but, uh, you, you know, I am tracking both. Here's the picture I want to take. And here are the, the means that are at my disposal. Yeah. You know, what the, the budget, the timing, the studio, the power, the gear, the crew, the parking, it's like you know, mo- all of those logistics. Yeah. Just like moving those pieces, you move the pieces differently for each job versus whatever the situation is. Like sometimes you got to move a couple. Right. Of, yeah. It's all, every situation is different. Right. How can I bend the logistics to get me the aesthetic I want? And, or how am I going to bend the aesthetic if I have to, to meet the logistics? Yeah. Yeah, it's a, so like when you say you, you don't shoot editorial to make money, you, do you basically just view it as almost like a promo piece to get you these like entertainment jobs where you're shooting like the key art and whatnot? Is that kind of how you view it pretty much just from like a business standpoint? Yes, I, I, I think I think that's how one has to view it. Yeah. You know, editorial um, has always been a showcase. Yeah. It's always been a gateway. Mm-hmm. You know, editorial fees are not tens of thousands of dollars you know editorial fees if there are any left to be had are five hundred dollars seven hundred fifty dollars a thousand dollars fifteen hundred dollars you know um if you're lucky yeah you know and and that's that is one of the great you know myths of or misunderstandings of of you know of the work i do and and you know editorial in general Mm -hmm. which is you know uh, when I when I am you know showing this stuff on Instagram, and people are thinking, man, you know he's got to make his you know ten grand. It's like I have never, ever <laughs> had a ten thousand dollar fee for an editorial project. Got never it. in my life. Yeah. Never. It might be there might oh be my exp- God, expenses though because I've actually if someone when I was setting this up they're like they're like ask art like. They're like, they don't get it. Like, cause you look at your Instagram, the behind the scenes stuff, you like be in this big studio and you got this big crew and it's for like editorial piece. So the magazine will pay for like the expenses, but then the fee is this, it's like you said, it's not that big pretty much. You, you know what? I'm going to jump, I'm going to jump into my database right now yeah. with you on the phone and I'm going to find, <laughs> um, uh, let's see. I'm going to find an old entertainment weekly shoot. Got it. Okay. Found it. And um, this this budget, um, okay, where did that go? All right, so this budget was like one of the uh, last, you know, massive, you know, budgets, like just crazy massive. It was like cover, um, cover, okay. cover, and then like inside, like feature. Oh yeah, yeah, yeah. Okay, found it. Okay, so this was a uh <laughs> this budget total budget was this 50 you, what's that i said this is why you're the best art you're not afraid to tell people shit because most people they, they they hide all these like secrets so i, so I really appreciate oh jesus it, man. christ no people, no, no, no. people this love is really it important yeah this this budget was a fifty five thousand dollar budget in this yeah magazine okay. entertainment and, weekly and yeah, and my fee was thirteen hundred dollars. Oh yeah, all right. That makes sense now. Yeah, because that's the same thing. Like I'm, so I've talked to so many photographers. They're like, like they're like, because these editorial shoots you're doing, they look like advertising productions, which they are, because it's like the crew and it's the grip and everything. But it's still you're still getting the same thing everyone else is getting, in terms of right. And the the very last massive uh, entertainment weekly shoot that I did, um, the budget. <laughs> Um, and I don't know that these are all of the numbers, yep. um, but I do try to put all of the numbers, you know, into my budgets, even if they're billing uh, the client directly. This budget is thirty three thousand dollars. And my fee was six hundred and fifty dollars. All right. Damn. And all that. Yeah. Work. All and that and you know what? <laughs> I am. I am so, so 
I've never done this before, yeah. you know, with, you know, on a podcast, certainly. Yeah. Um, and I've never like gone back and like verified these numbers. Yeah. Um, but um, I, I'm just so happy, honestly, to be able to do this and be able to, to let people know yeah. that, you know, these are not monster money making opportunities yeah. for me. Yeah. Um, the, the, the reason to shoot editorial is first of all, you have to love editorial and you have to love, um, you know, being able to somehow, you know, define, um, uh, or shape the cultural discussion Mm -hmm. about, you know, uh, newsmakers and tastemakers, uh, and, and document these people, um, or events in, in some small way. Um, that's number one. Number two is, the the ancillary part is you know your name is on the work yep. you know it is a live promo piece um that you know is dropping you know into uh on the newsstands and into your mailbox weekly or monthly or you know whatever it is hmm. but but i will say that that is a little bit of an old model because the new model really is instagram let's be honest 100%. you know yeah but so happy to be able to clear the air and, and you know, kind of uh, say, look, those fees are not huge. And while there is money to be made in syndication, yep. um, it's not like the old days where it was just, you know, uh, like a three ring circus. And I was never really part of the old days yeah. um, because, you know, between between the magazine and the uh, talent, they are severely limiting your resale, which is. A whole other discussion, which yep. I am happy to have some other time. Yeah, no, no doubt. Yeah, I appreciate it. Yeah, it gives a lot of insight because then it's like the real legwork for you is obviously, like you said, you're not making a ton of money on these editorial shoots. So then after the fact, it's like, all right, I shoot Tom Hanks or X, Y, and Z actor or whatever. Then it's like, how do I make money from these? You, you, you show them to the studios they work with. You show them to whatever other magazines or I guess studios or to get that the key artwork pretty much that's kind of the legwork that is true on the back end right? yeah yeah that is correct yeah no it's interesting uh a couple more yeah. questions i'll let you go uh, of course take your time all right cool man thanks art you're the man dude uh you know one project uh i was kind of excited to talk to you about it was really interesting series of portraits was called uh, cold water commuters it was a bunch of portraits mm-hmm. of i believe high school students if i'm correct yes. Um, yeah, how'd that, because I believe it was a personal project, how'd that kind of come about? Um, that's a great question, and I appreciate your diving into my personal projects. And um, the the high school that I went to um, uh, was celebrating its uh, 25th anniversary as a co-ed school. Mm-hmm. And I had gone there when it was all boys. And to celebrate, they invited three alums from three different decades to participate in um, a photo project. And there were three of us that, you know, had graduated and become personal, uh, had become professional photographers. There's a photographer from the 80s, uh, or a graduate from the 80s, me, uh, somebody from the 90s, and somebody from the aughts. Mm. And so each of us, you know, had to come up with some kind of project dedicated to the um uh to the school and what really intrigued me about um this this school you know 40 years later 30 30 years later um wait let me see 90 90, 90, yeah 35 years later was that the reach of the school because it had gone co-ed and because it was it had extended its ability to give scholarships to kids was now pulling in kids from all over the city. And there were kids that were these amazing kids that were spending an hour and a half or more one way going to school. So, so what I said to the school was give me a list of your seniors that, uh, live the furthest from the school and I want to go to their homes and do portraits of them. 
um, in their um, in their bedrooms. Mm. And I, I want to be able to show um, how, you know, kind of, you know, what their lives are like and how dedicated they are because these kids are spending so much time on the bus or in the car um, commuting to the campus on Coldwater Canyon in uh, North Hollywood. So I drove literally from the top of the city to the bottom of the city to the far reaches of the western end of the city to the far reaches of the eastern end of the city and did these environmental portraits of kids in their rooms. No, they came out great. They came out great because I I love seeing the contrast in your work because I think obviously everyone's you're so well known for the celebrities and like musicians and stuff. But I, I really really appreciate that work when you're just photographing like everyday people. It's just a it's a good contrast and I, I it was just powerful work. I think you know. Thank you. Yeah. Thank you very much. Yeah. I I um am just curious about people by nature mm-hmm. and there is a lot of reward and input and um uh i don't know satisfaction in photographing um people who aren't famous Mm. you know i it's it's you know you get to learn something you get to learn about somebody and you know see you know what they're up to and and what they've achieved and what they're doing work on and and um it's it's those kinds of shoots that are just so you know interesting to me in ways that photographing an actor or an actress just can't be mhm yeah no it's it's i think it's important work to do and uh i guess to wrap up art like uh what's next for you man like what what what's what are you kind of inspired by right now obviously it's stressful times but um i guess what what are you kind of hoping on to work on going forward? Anything you kind of got on the bucket list or anything like that, or what's kind of got you inspired right now, I guess. Wow. Um, well, I have to say that I am really inspired by the, uh, the social change that is happening in this country. I'm really inspired by and in awe of all of the new, um, visual voices that are being recognized and are emerging um, as a result of the marches and mm-hmm. um, a, um, a much more raised awareness of, um, uh, you know, diversity in photography. Yeah. Um, that's really inspiring. Um, I'm honestly, I'm inspired by my daughters who are just kind of entering the adult working world in um, one of the most the most difficult times in American history. Um, I'm inspired by my wife who is, you know, even as we speak sitting on the couch in our family room, um, still working at her job after a 20% pay cut. Um, uh, I'm inspired by my, um, uh, everybody I work with my, my staff for, you know, continuing to, support me and um, doing it remotely. And, you know, my longtime executive producer, um, Elaine Brown, has two small children. Mm -hmm. And I am just really in awe of her ability to um, uh, jump on a Zoom call and hide in her car so her kids don't see her. Um, (laughs) And and balance, you know, being a um, full-time mother with um you know the demands of of uh her professional life Mm. so really i'm inspired by the everyday i'm inspired by the the small business owners in and around my neighborhood who are attempting to uh keep the lights on and who are innovating and um you know finding ways to to serve their customers and um that's what i'm trying to do is to innovate and find new ways to serve my clients. Well, Art, uh, always a pleasure, man. I can't thank you enough. Like, I think more than anything, having the chance to talk with you a couple of times, the, the thing I really appreciate about, you, appreciate about you is obviously your work, such a big fan, but more so this the amount that you give back. And I think uh, myself, I, I'm trying to do that as much as I can. So uh, I can't thank you enough for everything you do for the photographic community. And uh, thanks so much. 
No, that really, really means a lot. It really, really, it really does. And um, um, it's my pleasure, and I'm always happy to talk. So there you have it. That was the Art Stryber interview. I just want to thank Art so much for taking the time to come on the podcast. Uh, Like I said, I've been a big fan of Art's work for years and really respect how much he gives back to the photographic community by sharing his knowledge and experiences with others. So I can't thank him enough. Uh, Definitely go check out Art's Instagram at AS Pictures. Uh, Lots of amazing work up there and Art's really well known for kind of posting behind the scenes photos and he kind of breaks down how he lights stuff and how he approaches individual shoots and whatnot. So lots of cool info on there. Uh, So definitely go give him a follow as well as his website at artstriber.com. Lots of amazing work up there and he's always updating it. So definitely go check that out as well. And as always, I'll be having weekly podcasts on iTunes, Spotify, as well as our U- our new YouTube page, uh, The Photo Banter. So definitely go check that out. I've been posting some of the video interviews and some other content. Um, so, yeah, thanks so much for listening and take care.